So repeat after me. Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna in the highest! celebration and also anticipation of this holy week, this Easter week to come. It is a blessing to be with you here. If you're joining us in the sanctuary, welcome. Those who are watching on our website, it is a blessing that you could find us as well. And as I like to, to say each Sunday, um, I want to welcome everyone. And if you are someone new or if you came with someone today, maybe it's your first time, we love to you know, get to know you, maybe just raise your hand and you can just tell us your name. We're so blessed that you're here today, but we also want to get to know you so that at coffee hour, we can find you and get to say hello. So is there anyone that's visiting today that would like to make themselves known? Yes. I'm going to need a little louder, I'm sorry. Robin? Robin. Robin. Thank you so much for being here, Robin. Glad you're here with us today. Hope to sit, talk to you after worship. Welcome. Anyone else? Well, one of the things we, we like to say and we like to embody at our, at our church and, and in, our, in our worship spaces is that whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever your faith tradition may or may not have been, whatever the seed of faith that you might have within you, Whoever you love, whatever you've done, you are welcome here. This body of faith, this body of Christ is made more whole because you are here. And as a celebration of that movement towards wholeness, let's take a few moments to stand up and greet one another in the name and love of Christ. <laughs>
invite, if we could return to our seats, we'll continue in the spirit of worship. And as I said, coffee hour is after the service. Please join us and continue that, that connection that you were just establishing. But at this time, I'd like to invite any of our young people up front for the children's conversation. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It's always good to be with you, especially today on Palm Sunday. But... Today, I just want to get right into it. I want to go deep quick, okay? Today, I want to talk to you about things that are endless, things that are never ending, okay? That means things that don't stop. They keep going on and on and on <laughs> and on. And I wondered if you could maybe, and I'm seeing some uh, hands going up. Can you tell me what are some things you could think of that are never ending? Humans. Humans. Ooh, wow, that's deep. How are humans never ending? Well, because you get born. <laughs> ah, so birth and rebirth. Okay, yeah, the idea that humans in general, right? Okay, wonderful. JJ? Um, humans won't be a thing in 1,000 years, but I think atoms. Atoms continue on. That, that theological comment, we're just going to let that sit there. Okay? <laughs> but yes, atoms continue on. Right matter. Life of Jesus and God. Yes, the life of Jesus and God. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. The world. The world is never ending. Life is eternal. Life is eternal, yes. Some form of life is eternal. Uh, let's go to uh, people that haven't had a chance yet. I love all this participation. The dishes. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? That's probably the most never-ending thing right there. Numbers. Numbers are never-ending, right. It was, uh, not long ago, it was Pi Day, March 14th. And if you ever heard of the number pi, that goes on a long time. Yeah, one more? Food. Oh, food, yeah, at certain places. Like, I remember when the Olive Garden used to have a never-ending pasta. <laughs> Does anyone remember that? Of course, it always ends because your stomach isn't as big as that bowl. But never-ending. Oh, I saw the movie Never-Ending Story once, and that's about two hours. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's actually a really good movie. How about a circle? A circle is something that's also never-ending. I like when, when you said the dishes. I thought that was such a good answer because there's things that are never-ending that we think of sometimes that are not the best. Like, what would be something you can think of that would is not, would just be, wow, if that was never-ending, that would be really horrible. Um, scooping poops. Oh, like from your pet? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> Phew! Okay, yeah, absolutely. That is not something I enjoy doing. I just like to let those return to nature. Uh, yeah, so chores, cleaning our room, doing homework, those kind of things. If they were never ending, that would really be hard. You know, I grew up in a church where the pastor's sermons seemed like they were <laughs> Anyway, there's one thing I could think of that doesn't end that's an awesome thing. Oh, oh, I don't. oh really? All right, I'm going to let you go for it. Um, your family. Oh, your family. You know what? It is part of your family in the sense that all of us are connected as a family, and one of the members of our family is someone who created us. Did you want to say something? Yeah. School. Well, school is definitely never-ending at times, Especially when you but that is not part of what I was thinking of now, thank goodness. But I'm talking about God, and I'm talking about the love God has for us. You know now that you walked in with those palms, and it's Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is a special time because it's the time when Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem, and he's greeted with cheers and celebration, and they think he's the king, and they're really excited, and then within days, that excitement changes to something very different, and by the end of the week, he's crucified, and then he dies on the cross, but then Easter happens, okay? And Easter is when that tomb that his body was put in is empty and he rises again. 
And all of this story, starting with Palm Sunday all the way through Easter week, is all about reminding us that God's love never ends. It never dies. So if I could have you remember one thing today, it would be that God created you and loves you so much. And that means that you can live with courage and strength today, that you can make powerful decisions, you can be bold and you can be loving because God is with you. God loves you and always will be by your side. And that, I promise you, will never end. Let's say a prayer together. God, thank you for creating us and for loving us always. The love that never ends. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a wonderful time in church school today. I'm excited to see what you get to do. Something that also never ends. Sometimes I feel like children's conversations are just hanging on to the reins of a wild horse. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe no reins. <laughs> All right. This would be a good time to have some prayer. So I want to invite you into a space of prayerful consideration, of listening, and maybe even of sharing something that you brought into the room today. But please be with me now in a moment of prayer. I want to start by lifting up all those civilians who are literally starving in Gaza. Just feet beyond where trucks with aid can help them. And we ask for our humanity to show up, to flood that region, to allow something of justice to happen for those that are innocent in this conflict. We pray, God, that your, your way of love, your way of sustaining presence will show us the way and help and let each one of us in voice and deed and heart be agents of that help as well. We continue to pray for Don Hopkins this morning. He is, he remains on hospice and he is slowly kind of going into different places of consciousness. He still has moments of lucidity. So uh, this is a good time if you, if you know or love, just cards are appreciated, um, but our love and our prayers are with Don and Marilyn and their whole family at this time. Also lift up a prayer for Roger Grice as he's continuing to recover from pneumonia and, and dealing with ongoing pain. We remember him, we, we love him, and we pray for Donna and all those who love and are caring for Roger. May his hope remain and may all of us as his faith family continue to show our care. I lift up now an opportunity for silent prayer. And in this space, you can call out a name or a joy or a concern. And then after a time, I'll say a pastoral prayer and we'll say the Lord's Prayer together.
God, on this Sunday of Palms, may we welcome you into this space and to our hearts and our lives in ways that might surprise us, even in ways we might not be prepared for. Break us open, God. Help us to tap into that excitement, that sense of hope and rejuvenation, that sense of possibility that your love and leadership and healing power might bring to us individually, communally, as a world. Sometimes it can feel so ineffectual to sit idly by as things are so challenging, so difficult, again, in personal life and in greater life together. But in this space, God, remind us that we truly are never walking alone. And that even in the fickle nature of our hearts and of this world, you continue to ride forward. You move in to the places that are necessary and you bring with you an unyielding hope and love. May each one of us do the same in our own ways, according to our own hearts, so that new life might be born, might be raised in each of us. God, we pray all of these things that have been spoken aloud. We pray to you the cares and concerns of our hearts. And we lift all that we are up to you as we say these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Continuing in our prayer, please turn with me to the back side of the worship sheet. Join me responsibly. Your portion of the responsive prayer is the bold. Jesus, you rode on. You rode over the cloaks and under the branches. You rode through the shouts and past the praises. Receiving the praise that you deserved, but not confusing our praise in your presence for your purpose in coming. Jesus, you rode on. You rode towards the controversy and the cause. You rode towards the curses and the cross. Receiving wounds you didn't deserve, sir. Enabling us to glimpse a love we could scarcely imagine. Jesus, you rode on. You rode through the tomb and the grave. You rode through our time and space. To show us a love that will never pass away and the life that will always remain, hearing us even now as we pray. Jesus, you rode on. We remember the journey you have taken as we commit ourselves to walking in the same way. God, give us the strength, hope, and joy we need as we follow. Amen. We stand and sing our opening room number 52. Hosanna, this is rising in your black Hallelujah song you find.
book of John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 11, in the New Revised Standard. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said that to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken, of those whom thou gavest me, I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? May God bless this reading and our understanding of it. I invite you into a space of prayer with me. God, may all the words, the movements, 
the emotion, the energy of what is shared here. Communicate your spirit. May it help us to more deeply understand and appreciate the walk of faith and who you are, who we are truly. Bless us in this time of sharing together. Amen. So you may have noticed I, I look a little different um, now. When I was in seminary in well, 20 plus years ago now, I had a horrible experience preaching my first time. And I was so thankful at that time that I was going into hospice chaplaincy because I would never have to preach. And my preaching professor was much more savvy. And she saw that I loved acting and present, presenting and stuff and, and public speaking. She said, you know, just be more, try something a little different. Tell a story. And so I began working on one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Judas. And trying to take the pieces and bits that appear throughout different gospels and in different places and communicate something of a cohesive story that not only tells a little more about who he is and what his motivations might be, but as I was praying, it's, it's about who we are oftentimes. So this is the fruits, part of the fruits of that ongoing labor. This has been an ongoing project of mine. Um, I haven't done this live since 2005. But I, if you were here during COVID, you may have seen this or something like this um, presented. But anyway, this is called Judas Speaks. And of course I knew where to find him that night. I've been there many times before. I met the centurion at the East Gate and we walked down, down into the valley of Kidron, and then up toward lonely Gethsemane. The Mount of Olives wasn't far. We did make more noise than I had hoped, though. That the armor, it, it, it rattled. When we got there, it was much as I expected, except for one thing. The disciples, they, they slept. They slept. Jesus was so deep in prayer, he was surrounded before anyone knew what was going on. At first there was confusion, and then fear, and then horror when they realized who it was. I went up to Jesus and I said, greetings, Master. And I kissed him. That's what I did. You never quite get over it, do you? After all these years, some 20 centuries, you still don't know what to do with me. <laughs> I stick out like a, a thorn in the side of Christian conscience. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. Once my name was common in Judea, it was honored. A firstborn son would proudly be called Judas but today, who would even name their dog Judas? Where my story is known, my name is reserved for traitors. I raise doubts and scandalous questions. Like, well, if Jesus was so good, how could he choose a, a disciple who's disloyal? If Jesus is so wise, how could he pick a traitor? How could I have done it? Why did I do it? Did I do it? <laughs> when it comes to evil, you Christians can be so naive. How easily good is betrayed by a friend and with a kiss. We seldom talk about the outrage that Jesus created I was never comfortable with tax collectors. 
They were Roman collaborators. They were more like your mafia than anything else. I had a uh, much easier time with the women. Jesus would sit around at a table all night with them, with all of us, and just talk all through the night. And you know, many who were with our group were from outside the Torah. That's why the scribes would often ask, why? Why do you eat with traitors and with prostitutes? We were a ragged bunch. Some of us were fishermen. A few of us were poets. All of us were dreamers. And then there were the women. Bias has buried their names. I kept track of the money. Yes, that's right, money was just as important for us as it is for you. And where did it come from? Well, you know, it's right in your book. It's just overlooked. Those women that I mentioned, there were many of them part of us, and they helped to finance our group. So you may ask, what kind of wild madman would betray his friend with a kiss? Well, let me say that I'm not so different than the others. There are good things to say about Judas. I too left my livelihood to follow him. God knows I have more credentials than one who fished for a living. But Jesus could see my potential, so it didn't get me, take me long to get into the inner circle. He saw my promise, my passion for Israel, my love of adventure. They made me treasurer. I bought the provisions for the entire group. I was certainly the best businessman in the bunch. But the question remains, how could someone with so much potential, so much promise, sink so low? Money. Money. You always say it's about the money. Everybody has their price. And I think to myself, how easily one generation smears another with its own sin. Thirty pieces of silver. Would that be enough for you? And would such a paltry sum as that explain my remorse and my suicide? It's hardly enough to buy a slave. And let me tell you, when I held those coins in my hand, they burned my flesh. They seared my conscience. They made me question my life. I tried to give them back. If only evil could be so easily canceled. Oh, oh Pilate, Pilate could wash his hands. But I couldn't abandon my bargain. I, I went back to the temple even, and, and, I, and I threw them on the floor. And they looked at me like I was crazy. They were appalled that I could do such a thing. And that's when it hit me. Oh, I see how money changes color. Because those same funds that bought my deed, that came from this very treasury, are now considered blood money. No longer fit for the temple treasury. So money? That doesn't explain Judas Iscariot. But some others do say that resentment fueled my betrayal. In particular, I was angry at Jesus when he rebuked me because of that woman when she was anointing his feet with that expensive perfume. And yes, I did think we should have sold that perfume and given the money to the poor. And yes, Jesus did rebuke me. But I was never rebuked as often as Peter. Others say that since I was the only disciple from the south, from the hill country of Judea, that I had different customs, maybe a different accent, that I stood out like a, a hillbilly at the opera. But just remember this. They respected Judas. So resentment? Nothing more than speculation. Others think, well, maybe I alone was aware that, that, that it wasn't going to work out, that things were falling apart, that Jesus had failed. 
and that all the authorities were coming in to tear down our crazy little plan. And so in an act of desperation, I just threw the whole cause overboard. Cowardice, they say. But come on. Would a coward dare to seek out temple authorities to step into their sanctuary to sell one's leader? And besides, who were the ones who jumped in the bushes after we arrived? <laughs> so who can explain it? Some people understood that I was a revolutionary. That I wanted to reestablish the integrity of Israel and to cast off Rome. Have our own land again. And I was getting impatient. Because it seemed like Jesus was just wasting so much time. All these, these critical moments to gather popular support, to confront Rome, were passing us by. And so I, I, I wanted to force his hand. He promised us a kingdom, didn't he? I imagined myself his chief warrior. And I was itching to do unto those Romans as they had done unto us. But Jesus was not seeking my kind of kingdom. And it wasn't from Rome that he was trying to save us. Jesus' kingdom was of the heart. He would have saved us from ourselves. And so my heart grew bitter. He spends all this time with traitors, prostitutes, the pathetic and the maimed. My king goes on soothing hearts and minds while everything around us is collapsing. Jesus was the only one who could have freed us from Rome. And all he had to do was say the word and we would have been there, but he never did. As Soon as it looked like something was gonna happen, something dangerous, maybe someone would get hurt, he'd back off. But seriously, yeah. How does anything ever change? And so I took matters into my own hands. So, who can explain it? I, I don't know. Pick your motive. They're all slippery. It, whether it's money or ethnic distance, resentment, or that I was a revolutionary, we're always looking for reasons. But reasons seldom explain anything. The truth is, I just stick like a thorn in the side of your gospel. An ugly element in an otherwise mighty message. <clears throat> so let's just let it go with this. I represent the capacity that each one of us has all of the time to commit evil. What a are there some of you out here that hold yourselves beyond, morally beyond evil? Maybe you're sitting and t telling yourself now, oh, I wouldn't have betrayed Jesus. Well, let me tell you, Peter thought that too. Those of us who know their capacity for evil are better protected. God save us from the righteous ones in our midst, the ones so convinced of their own goodness. They're the dangerous ones. So please, when you worship, just say your confession. Say your confession because possibilities for evil are kissing cousins to prospects for good. And don't ask science or knowledge to deliver you from evil. Science is great, but it's ethically neutral. Knowledge can only get you so far. After all, wouldn't we admit that the only thing worse than a devil is an educated devil? <laughs> no, Jesus taught you to pray. Thy will be done. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. That's right. Say me. Forget that polite, vague way we have of saying us. It's me. Because anyone with, with high morals and, and, and good intentions can fall in an instant. We're all responsible for our own choices and our decisions. 
We all have the gift and the curse of free will. I know that as well as anyone. I know that some of you would like to just wipe me off the record so that the slate could be cleaned of Judas. I know this because I walk into your churches and I see stained glass representations of 11 of the disciples, but not 12. Why? Why leave me out? You can't ignore me. I, I'm always a part of you. Let this be said. God is not mocked. Those 30 pieces of silver, the ones I threw on the temple floor, what happened to them? Well, they were used to buy a field, a worthless plot of ground that no one wanted. It was called Hakodama, which means potter's field. What was that field used for? Well, it was used to bury paupers, aliens, people with no name, no story, the ones that nobody wanted. Oh, how appropriate is that? The funds that bought my deed were used to create a place where forgotten, discarded, ignored human beings could be laid to rest before God. Even my end has a poetic power and a mighty message. No evil so perverse as to be utterly beyond God's love. You see, God is not mocked. Not by you and not by Judas. Amen. I sang this song earlier this year. It's a song I wrote uh, when Dan was doing a sermon on Scrooge a couple years ago. And then when he asked me about finding a song about forgiveness and the ability to... Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> When he asked me to find a song uh, about forgiveness, ultimate forgiveness of those uh, who either society or themselves deem as unforgivable, like uh, Scrooge before his uh, conversion after the ghosts, and uh, like Judas, who eventually felt remorse. I uh, came up with this song, the chorus is printed in, uh, on the back. And, uh, start with the chorus.
pride and kept him small He let love close but never end Show the world how good he was By carrying his sin A shuttered heart Dark with pain Never feels the sunshine Never tastes the rain Nothing flows and nothing grows All clenched and closed up tight Sometimes all that's missing Is someone who will listen Love that's freely given Stones of sins forgiven we carry to this day to show the world we won't forget so proud how much we've paid our suffering is useless there's no fruit plants no seed lay them down and free our hearts and hands to help the world in need a shattered heart dark with pain Never feels the sunshine, never tastes the rain. Nothing flows and nothing grows, all clenched and closed up tight. Sometimes all that's missing is someone who will listen. Love that's freely given, a window to the light. It sounds so good, say it. Sometimes all that's missing. Sometimes all that's missing is someone who will listen. Love that's freely given. Window to the light. Good morning. <laughs> Good to see all of you. Um, a couple of announcements today. Uh, first of all, the Maundy Thursday soup supper and service will take place this Thursday, March 28th at 6 p.m. in Overmiller Hall. Please join us as we remember Jesus' command to love one another just as I have loved you. You know, this time of year, I'm starting to have dreams about Easter eggs and uh, chocolate bunnies. I don't know about you, but I hope you will plan on your kids attending the great Easter egg hunt next Sunday, following the regular Sunday service on the church grounds. Word is, there will be an appearance by the Easter Bunny. Ooh. Weather permitting, weather permitting, the Easter sunrise service will take place at the Cons home next Sunday at 6.30 a.m. Sunrise will be at 6.49 a.m. And they are located at 291 Russell Road. Now that's a lot of numbers to remember. So if you don't remember, be sure to check your, your uh, church newsletter. And remember, coffee and pastries will be served. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gayla. I love how you do announcements. <laughs> I do want to add just one thing. While we're not hosting a Good Friday service here, we have encouraged people to look to, uh, to attend the Teze service at the Mercy Center, which is a beautiful candlelight service. And then this year, I also want to encourage anyone who would like to, to join me uh, in attending the candlelight service at Loomis United Church of Christ. You may remember that one year ago, they were part of a really brutal campaign, misinformation campaign, because they have such a strong advocacy for LGBTQ youth with their landing spot, their safe haven uh, for, for many people in that community. And so this Good Friday is an attempt with candlelight service uh, to, to acknowledge and shine a light on their struggle and on the resiliency and on our love for them as they heal from what happened a year ago. In this service of music, testimony, and light, we seek to heal one another and our world. So that is at 6 p.m. on Friday, March 29th. And I don't know this, the, 
Sisters of Mercy, the Mercy Center service time, but it's probably close to that too. That's all I had to add. Amen. Again, Jane, not here with us today, but here in spirit as she picked this last hymn for us to sing. It's a new one. So as we stand and sing number 507, O Christ, my Lord, create in me. The musicians will play through it once. something out of your pocket, out of your heart. We are so grateful for your ongoing generosity. And now as we prepare ourselves to leave, may we go to make of our lives the plowshare rather than the sword. May we be witness to the power of peace. And where the kingdoms of this world fall by the wayside, let us lift up the vision that Jesus was about. When people meet us this week, every day, may they know that the message of God's love is alive and well. Go in that spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.